good. And that's good. And I can see that your slides are all ready to rock and roll as well. So over to you. Thank you, Stella. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So from what I was hearing and as, as I came into the call today, uh, there's been some phenomenal information going around here. And so much of it is actually really heavily reliant on what I'm here to talk about. How process automation and intelligent software and how it impacts the CX at your service desk. We have the tool sets. We know we have those. That's not a problem. Um, just bear with me because my slides don't seem to want to move forward for some reason. So first, let me just start by saying, plain and simple, um, although it seemed a little bit of a cautionary tale, I will say automation is awesome. It is saving us time. It increases our speed of delivery, drops in operational costs, you know, and, and minimizing on human error uh, and flexibility that we've never had before. The customer experience, however, in this is is definitely one of those topics that we do consider when we look at automation. But most of us in IT have a tendency to look at automation more about what it can give us in the necessity of precision and cost efficiency. So what I've been hearing over the years since I've started doing this type of work, a lot of different models kind of come out from, from the different people that you meet through the organizations. And that definitely changes with organizations, depending on, you know, what kind of an, uh, an organization you've got. If it's a smaller org that was very used to doing things, one-offs coming together, they don't have a tendency to enjoy our transformations as much as the rest of us do. As you can see, these are some of the ones that have stuck out in my head over the years. You know, people saying, I wish I could just call. IT used to be so much easier. And in some aspects, that is very much the case. Um, we've, we've moved into an amazing level of digital transformation over the last couple of years. And as we take those steps, uh, we, we normally get positive and negative responses. There is a shift going on in statistics every year of people who would rather chat than talk to somebody directly. And that's on an increase. Customers are changing as we're changing. But in a lot of cases, to accept the technology and the way we're doing it, because so much is not known by people outside of the IT organizations, they need a little bit more guidance and trust with the organization to, to really see it to the next steps. So when I start looking at it from any kind of an organization perspective, the first question I always like to ask, and I, I ask myself this question almost on a daily basis, would I be happy with the service that I'm providing to my own customers? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, it's very dependent on, on what you're running into. So, as I said, you know, you've heard a lot of information about all the technical side of things, the statistics. As I've been watching in the polls that have been coming out over the last few minutes, I realized very quickly that many people are on their way. Um, you've been doing your due diligence. Chances are you've been going to webinars, learning as much as absolutely possible about what you're about to do or already well in process of doing. Some of the things that stick out, though, is that we need to, in a lot of cases, look at it very much backwards than what we'd normally do. We have a tendency to look at all those great things we get from an IT perspective, you know, minimization on tasks. None of us like to do the same tasks over and over again, so we do try to avoid it. But we need to look at it from the customer perspective more so than our own. So some of the top points that I definitely take into consideration and would would wager anyone who's been doing this for a while is definitely after hitting pitfalls as they've come, is walking the processes. That is so high on the priority list. 
if you don't understand what your your customer is seeing, you're never going to understand the impact that it's having on them. You'll never understand how it feels when something does go wrong, because inevitably there will be a gap somewhere and you will work it out, but it does take time. Don't just look at IT people, grab people from the rest of the organization because they do look at it differently. They will see it from their perspective, whether they're in finance, HR, FP&A, it doesn't matter. Every one of them will come with a, a very distinctive look and perspective to give you more detail. To go with that is also any department that is possibly even remotely coming close to touching your process. Uh, when it, you know, for, for things like an onboarding processes in a company, which for most companies is one of the highest priorities, you need the involvement, you need to have those different departments work with you because most automation will run into its difficulties as it crisscrosses across processes throughout different departments within the org. Invest the time on the people side of the automation. Now, I believe Wayne made a comment earlier about this, that we are there to enable the business to work. And one thing that you've seen over the years is there's been this, this mindset and it's gratefully starting to disappear from our, our orgs now. But a lot of people thinking automation meant automatically that we would be able to get rid of more people, we could cut down on staff, you know, look at it very much from that, that single point. But that's actually not the case. What you're seeing is that people are now being moved more into roles to learn more about the technology in the back end to understand it, to be more sparring partners, in fact, with business members so they can actually work and understand. It brings, in fact, automation is driving us to that next level of service desk where you start talking about skilled service desks who do their own automation, who get involved, who really work with these things. It's no longer, it enables them to no longer be in a position to just say, yes, I've got it, I'll pass it on. They actually help drive those changes. And that gets forgotten by a lot of organizations as well. The more time that your IT staff are involved in the automation process, the better they're able to help land it. And especially at Service Desk, we are the first line. We are the ones that see everything first, we hear it first, we're involved first. If these guys are the ones that are actually helping to drive the automation, both from the IT perspective, but also communication into the business layers, it's it's a win-win situation for everyone. Um, Wayne hit it when he said, not all challenges are unique. And we do have a tendency to look at everything we're doing as it being unique. You know, every company does things a little bit different. Uh, it's it's a harsh wording, but I'm gonna use it. I, I heard it many, many years ago from somebody who said, we're not special. And for many of our processes, we're not. If we were special, we wouldn't have the standards that we have today to help drive us to the next levels. But with that, processes are not always black and white. So when you're, you're actually automating things, you really need to reevaluate every step of your process because certain things will work amazingly well on paper or in that Google form that you were using or uh, whatever it may be that you're using in the back end. But as we take it to those next stages, we need to truly understand, does this still work? Do we need all of these different pieces? And of course, the big one that I love to live by constantly and nonstop, challenge everything. The more simplified we make it, the less problematic it can actually give us. This is where a lot of things tend to go wrong because we do have a tendency to overthink we, how we work and how we design our processes. It's only when it's laid out in front of you that you really see that it's going in a different shape. The biggest one, there is no finish line when it comes to automation. 
as as we implement more and more automation that gives us more data and i believe the next speaker is coming up and we'll talk to you about great things about data but this allows us to see on a much better scale how things are working um, where we need to make adjustments as the data comes in it allows us to anticipate business needs in a faster and more proactive manner it allows us to get ahead and really become a sparring partner and a part of what the organization is trying to deliver and that aligns very well in most cases with the strategy plans for the overlaying companies and you bring those together by working on your continuous quality improvements as a part of your service improvement plans uh, as throughout the year. So where, where to begin is really a big thing for a lot of companies because there are so many phenomenal tools on the market today to really kind of bring us you know, the, the new types of information that we've never been able to get before where you used to have three or four systems daisy chaining together to be able to deliver one kind of automated process. Today, there are so many tools that just come out of box. You can light them up and away you go. But that is also a bit of the problem. We need to look at it more of what does your organization need first? Does it need you to go off and build a fortress of automation or does it need some of those smaller to tokens and topics to be addressed at the first point? Password resets is something that you can really break it down into small core components. You can look at every individual password if you've got systems that are still a bit more legacy that don't go behind single sign-on. Um, there are needs to still have more than just the one and by doing this you can basically break it down into different pieces where you start to understand the impact that it has does this process have impact on something else yes or no and the less impact that it has the better it is for the beginning stages of your journey as you go past with the type of transformation you're on right now uh, knowledge is a big thing both internally for the IT organization as well as for the end users. End users love self-service as long as it works properly. It's when we make them jump through hoops that they have a tendency to get very bothered and not start to buy into what we've been telling them is so amazing for them. And um, so that, that also then helps to drive the next pieces. And you do see a bit of a domino effect because request prov uh, provisioning and ticket processing as well as follow-ups are things that people are used to being able to do but i've seen time and time again in several different organizations over the years that the same people who have always been against provisioning of their own software or getting their own requests in are the ones that actually become your biggest seller to the rest of the organization because they realize the amount of time they save. And that's exactly where you see it, is that it has to answer that question of what is it? How does it make them feel? And most importantly, we do look at it from our own perspective, what's in it for me? If you can't answer the question of what's in it for you or what's in it for your customers, chances are it should drop down your list on the, the priorities. So this is an old quote that I've had stuck in my head for many years, and I think it it really kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do uh, with how we're implementing. We do want to take those next steps. We want to drive further. We take into consideration, you know, all of the different technologies. But at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to nothing more than communication and process design. Any system that you go to implement will work properly for your organization. As long as your processes are streamlined, the people involved in your processes are also comfortable with what you're doing and make sure that there are no gaps on those sides as well. And then you can bring it to that next level. No matter how good or how bad a software 
or a package or a script that you're writing will work if you're not taking the whole supply chain, the whole life cycle internally into consideration, you're going to run into problems. And then what happens is your customers start to look at it in a different manner for you as well. Because I believe the, the old statement was always that it was for every one bad customer experience, it takes 12 to overturn it. And in an internal environment, that leads to quite a lot of different points and openings for things to happen. We saw it many years ago when IT were still in the mindset of no, 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 we'll give you what you want, maybe, but we'll definitely deliver something. And that was the way it was 20 plus years ago where we did things in more of a siloed mode. And that put us into a position where there was a lack of trust and it, it bred things like shadow ITs within organizations. Whether we want them or not, this is going to come. It's good for service desks. It allows our people to look at more to topics and tasks instead of doing the exact same things over and over. But if we don't tread lightly to make sure that we're meeting all of those different components and as it states here, conditions, making sure they're triggering, we should know about it after the fact if we've done it correctly. And if we haven't, I'll assure you that your customers will be finding you much quicker when something goes wrong. And then you're gonna have a lot further to walk to get back to where you were because it always is the trust factor when you're looking at internal companies. And I think I've landed on time, no less. Or oh, some you have, absolutely. That's some grit, some sage advice there. Um, and, and as you rightly, you know, referenced to the amount of engagement that we've got in the event today and, and where people are on that journey, it's, it's a very exciting time, I think, to be part of that that change from the old to the new. You know, I think there's there's a there's a that that new place. I think is um for many, certainly for me, I think you know, as as an ex practitioner, that nirvana, as long as it's as long as it's doing the right stuff around that ethics and doing the right thing for the individual, as you said, what's in it for me? We've got a question um, come through from Natalia and, and we referenced change earlier. Um, Wayne talked about the power of change. And I think, I don't know, I think uh, certainly my experience is change isn't seen as is some, something more of a more, more of an issue, something to avoid in some cases yeah. rather. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we've got a question from Natalia. <clears throat> And I think that's because it's quite, I think change is quite complex. You know what I mean? So she's asking with a, a bigger uh, picture, um, uh, amount of use cases automated, how do you track the changes effectively? So let's say there's a process that's been added to, to a chatbot and later processes are changed as well, or uh, or as part of a, another, um, you know, change in that, in that sort of workflow. How do you actively track and plan automation updates? How do you manage all that in your experience? <laughs> with great caution <laughs> um, yeah you know it's it you'll come down to a point where you start to look at it from a different kind of level where you do take into consideration you're going to have steering committees because you are going to be touching mm. the business side of things um, where when you're implementing especially something like a chatbot which is very very personal and a lot of them have a tendency to be very forgive me for this but very IT Mm, um, yeah, you do need to rely on a governance governance type of document, and we have a tendency to look at governance very much on on prem systems, mm. but that's not the case anymore. You know, in this new model that we're working on today, on prem is becoming a lesser item mm. than what we've ever seen before. Imagine five years ago, companies were looking at you going, uh, "I'll keep my data center. I'm not going anywhere." Mm. Now that's the times are changing. But a lot of these really great processes that we've always had in place will still work. And it is a combination of a few things. Definitely the communication, um, record keeping. I love using an ITSM tool myself. That's mine, uh, where all of that goes so that when something happens, you see your list, change management in there. Some companies do change for impact. Some do it in functionality as well. Um, 
I think if you're really trying to drive to make sure that you're not stepping on any of the other systems or toes, having a single system of record is definitely the way to go because you can audit that. Mm. And then when you are starting to do an implementation, you spend some time going through your system, looking at the, the release notes or the change notes that have been done over the previous versions, which you do try to keep it very nipped so that you don't end up with an encyclopedia to read through. Um, you'll be able to actually go back and look at it and have that little bit more of a roadmap. I am also a firm believer in mapping out your service improvement plans at the beginning of the year. Uh, and keeping those up to date. I love to go back and look at what we did the year before just to see, did we meet all of it? Is there things that we could have improved? And then I take those notes to the following year. So it is really about record keeping and communication mm -hmm. um, while staying well within the boundaries of the frameworks that we're used to using. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've seen frameworks that that have you know certainly developed over the last couple of years. With where where now I think, and I said this a while back actually, that they sort of make more sense as as we've pushed further into this new world. They sort of make more sense, um, maybe than than the changes that were 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 made originally. And I think that's because you know as you said a few years ago, it's a slightly different. We were framed differently in what we did, and I think there are still organisations out there that are going to be framed in the old way. Certainly, we deal with them. You know, they're still in a very old fashioned approach to the way that they deliver service. And as you said, I think um, you're absolutely right around that communication uh, and, you know, how, how everybody's informed, engaged with as part of that, too. And, and I don't know from your in your experience, if you look at um, the concepts, you know, if you look at that dev concept and the DevOps stuff and you look at organizations changing the way the relationship between groups of people and you look at something like SRE, right? Yeah, which which. Um, uh, I think is over the last couple of years has come to the forefront in the way that people expect organizations to adapt to becoming in this new place. Is that something that you've seen that sort of SRE, that Google SRE sort of relationship between devs and ops almost being intrinsically linked, being the same team almost? Have you seen, have you seen much of that in your experience? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, as, as if I think back to where I started and I'm going to age myself here, so I apologize mm -hmm. for that. But uh, when I remember starting in IT, you know, we'd meet with people in the business side of the house. They'd tell us what they needed. Yeah. And we'd scamper off back into IT, figure it out, and a year later come back and wonder why it didn't meet the requirements. <laughs> and we did that for a long time. We lived in our black box. Um, but it had to change because the industry was changing around us. And as we moved to this new model, we found it worked much better for us. Um, the big component of that, though, is definitely this interaction that you get between teams. Mm. And this is also why you see such an increase and a rise in things like matrix organizations. Because one person could have uh, indirect lines to two or three different managers just to make sure that we're not losing things. We're not losing the capabilities that people can bring. Mm. And you're going to see that continue. We are melding more and more and we're becoming, you know, I, I notice over the last years, I work a great deal more with other IT departments and I spend more time with them in some cases than I do with, you know, doing certain things in my own team. And it's because that is the clincher. Uh, and, and they do, it's, it's phenomenal. The, the level of work and the level of drive, that you see when people in, in IT get that true and absolute visibility of what's going on around them. They think with you and they drive forward with you. Yeah, that's great. Brilliant. Stella, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for the questions uh, again, guys, and, and Natalia. Um, thank you very much. That was great. Hopefully, we get a chance to do this again uh, very soon. Thank you for that, Stella. And um, yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thanks. Good. Okay, we're going to move on. And just before our next um, our next speaker, we're going to have another another yes another poll. You guessed it, another poll. So um, as it's just just been launched there, and you'll see a question there in relation to your your attitude, your individual attitude to the future of process automation. And there are a couple of sort of. Um,